The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Kathy Morrison, Director of the Center for International Studies. And I want to welcome you to our third event uh, in our series on food security and insecurity uh, for the spring quarter uh, of this year. I would uh, remind you, those of you who attended previous events in the series that we have an ongoing Twitter discussion. And the hashtag is CIS food security, all one word. So if you want to uh, participate in that way, you're certainly welcome to do so. Our co-sponsor tonight um, helping us with the recording of this, the tonight's event is the University Communications Office. Today we have a, a, a special and very important event in our series um, in which we're going to discuss some alternative intellectual frameworks um, for thinking about these issues and especially the concept of food sovereignty with a very distinguished panel of scholars here today. So our format is this, a little different from our usual routine. We'll have uh, three speakers, as you can tell. So each person will speak, and then uh, I'll play host, and we'll have a kind of moderated panel discussion up here. So we will not have questions from the audience, as we often do. But there will, of course, be time afterwards to chat. Uh, and of course, you can always use technology, such as Twitter and so on, to interject your own perspectives. So let me just introduce our three speakers all together at the beginning. Um, we have, um, from this end of the table toward me, uh, Professor Hannah Whitman, who is an assistant professor of sociology and a member of the Latin American Studies program at Simon Fraser University. Uh, she conducts collaborative research on local food systems, food serenity, and agrarian citizenship with the Landless Rural Workers Movement and La Via Campesina in Brazil, and with community farming networks uh, in British Columbia. She's the co-editor of um, Food Sovereignty, Reconnecting Food, Nature, and Community, Food Sovereignty in Canada, and Environment and Citizenship in Latin America, um, Nature's Subjects and Struggles. The title of her talk tonight is Peasants' Rights or Food Riots, The Challenges of Institutionalizing Food Sovereignty. Professor Rachel Besner Kerr is an assistant professor of geography at the University of Western Ontario and the research coordinator of the Soils, Food, and Healthy Communities Project in Malawi. She conducts community-based research on the linkages between social and environmental inequalities in agriculture, uh, health and nutrition, and work that's done in collaboration with smallholder farmers in a hospital in northern Malawi. Um, her specific areas of work have included linkages between HIV AIDS affected families, agricultural pr practices, uh, food security and health, and um, something very close to my heart, historical and contemporary perspectives on the increased use of drought tolerant crops such as sorghum and millet. Yeah. Her title tonight is Agroecology and Food Sovereignty in Malawi. And then uh, finally, we have Professor Philip McMichael who is an international professor in the Department of Development Sociology at Cornell. Um, trained as an historical sociologist, his research examines capitalist modernity through the lens of agrarian questions, uh, food regimes, agrarian food sovereignty movements, and most recently, the implications for food systems of agrofuels and land grabbing. His work involves consul consultation with the FAO, the International Planning Committee of, for Food Sovereignty, La Via Campesina, Food First Information and a Action Network, and the Eco, Eco Agriculture Partners Project, Landscapes for People, Food, and Nature Initiative. And the title of his talk today is Food Sovereignty versus Food Security, a Global Conundrum. So let's start with Professor Whitman. Thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you especially to Jamie Bender for organizing this, this panel and um, our trip here. It's been really great to, to come and learn about your programs here. I, I'm going to talk today about a project that um, looks at the juxt juxtaposition, juxtaposition of an international human rights discourse around the right to food with on-the-ground implementation. Rights talk has a lot of traction in today's uh, environment, and we're going to see how this actually is being worked out, what are the challenges and what are the, intention, what are the tensions in different ways of thinking about the right to food. So how does the right to food, which is a predominantly consumerist concern, how do people get food to eat, how does that interact with demands to protect the rights of peasants, 
uh, food producers who actually need land and need, and need markets to be able to provide a living not only for themselves but for their communities. So I've worked with rural agricultural communities in Latin America for almost two decades, uh, Brazil, Paraguay, Guatemala, and currently working with local food movements in British Columbia to look at what are the challenges to implementing a food sovereignty framework and what are the implications of this framework for global hunger and environmental sustainability. So food security, the concept of the idea of food security as a right emerged in the post-World War II uh, context as a universal ideal to end world hunger. It was enshrined in the 1948 Universal Declaration, Declaration of Human Rights and the 1966 International Covenant of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. This, on the screen you see a quote from the 1974 Universal Declaration on the Eradication of Hunger and Malnutrition. This is from the first UN sponsored World Food Summit where Henry Kissinger famously declared that by 1985 no child would go to bed hungry. To this end, uh, national and multilateral food security policies and programs have been oriented around the idea of specialization, comparative advantage, trade, and aid-based <coughs> food distribution programs to consumers, rather than emphasizing community control over food production, distribution, and consumption. So agricultural trade liberalization concretized through the 1995 WTO Agreement on Agriculture has decimated national agricultural systems, particularly in developing countries. The FIO uh, estimates that nearly 30 million peasants have lost access to land since the, the mid-1990s. And people are still losing land in what is known as the global land grab, not only for mining and oil, but increasingly for agriculture. Uh, some estimates uh, indicate 227 million hectares have been uh, taken away from small-scale producers in the last decade. Today, global grain trade is concentrated in just five companies, and national agricultural systems, particularly in Latin America, are oriented to specialized export-oriented crops, soybean and sugarcane in Brazil, where I work, peas and broccoli in Guatemala, flowers in Colombia. We've also seen a race to the bottom in terms of environmental and social practices accompanying uh, trade liberalization, with a corresponding rise in de deforestation, environment, environmental degradation, and increasing levels of malnutrition. So food is thus increasingly mobile and food prices are increasingly volatile. Global food imports were up 25% in 2011, $1.3 trillion, uh, a second jump after major food prices and, and a proliferation of food riots uh, in 2008 and 2009. So how has all of this mobility in terms of food production and food trade affected the right to food? We've seen periods of food price volatility, we've seen food riots across the globe, tortilla wars, bread and rice riots. We've seen urban people whose wages aren't rising accordingly to be able to accommodate these rising food prices. We've also seen rural peoples who, who produce export-oriented crops also suffering hunger because those, those rising food, food prices aren't trickling down to producers. Okay? So today, about one billion people still face hunger in the world, according to the WTO, or according to the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. So from a human rights framework, the right to food, from a distributionist perspective, must be guaranteed by states. But the consolidated international trade model hasn't worked very well to protect the right to food, to enact it. So Bruce Dernin, a Canadian food systems activist, is critical of much of the food rights discourse he argues that the human right to food has been, has been has transformed, the sort of discourse around the right to food has transformed a human necessity into a legal claim to be granted by some authority or another. And he says that it actually may put communities in a position of dependency. So what about the rights of communities to decide about how they want to get their food and to protect their environments? How can they actually reduce their dependency uh, to uh, face challenges around hunger. So there's a tension around the rights of consumers to access cheap food and the rights and responsibilities of producers to produce food that is healthy, sustainable, and accessible. So the grassroots critiques uh, have emerged around food sovereignty, particularly sharpening in the, the mid-1990s, the early 1990s, focused on the importance of community farming systems which were threatened by these neoliberal agricultural policies that have reduced support for national agricultural systems and facilitated the dumping of food commodities. 
1993, a coalition of uh, agrarian movements, so peasant social movements, small farmers, fisher folk, uh, artisanal um, indigenous peoples, and pastoralists got together and discovered some common interests in, this, in trying to challenge the current uh, global food uh, system. So today, this organization called the, the Via Campesina encompasses 150 national organizations from 70 countries and represents about 200 million uh, farm families, peasants, and, and fisher folk. In 1996, at the, at the next World Food Summit in Rome, the Via Campesina presented an alternative concept, which is the concept of food sovereignty, or the right of local populations to define their own agricultural and food policy to organize their food production and consumption to meet local needs, and to secure access to land, water, and seed. And the framework of food sovereignty encompasses a new set of value relations and approaches to rights. It's concerned with the survival of small farms and ecological sustainability. It's concerned with decision making, ways of participating in food policy decisions at various scales, from the local to regional to national and international. Uh, sustainable food production for the local community is seen as an act of citizenship contesting neoliberal conceptions of citizenship as primarily accessed through participation in a global market. And in response, we've seen new institutional measures emerging, constitutional provisions and amendments in several countries, laws, policies, and programs in others. This is a slide from the uh, a community center in the downtown east side of Vancouver, where I live, which is the poorest postal code in all of Canada, one of the most uh, places where the, we have the highest levels of poverty and, and, and a number of social problems. And, and this, this uh, slogan painted on the outside of the building represents the alternative demand from the consumer's per perspective for a human right to food that is now transformed from a demand for simple calories and nutrients to more specific claims around culturally appropriate, dignified, fresh, and local food, especially in instances where, in instances where the state from a rights framework, having the responsibility to provide these choices through food social safety nets. So locally produced food in this framework is thought to be more nutritious and better tasting. In addition, the, circ the circulation of locally produced food maintains the food dollar in a local economy. Food sovereignty advocates argue that food aid, when that means dropping in subsidized commodities from elsewhere, can actually undermine the local economy by taking away jobs, both farming and urban processing jobs, from local communities. The food sovereignty framework thus seeks to connect this urban demand for the right to a particular kind of food with the demands of rural producers to produce food in an ecologically sound manner in a process of creative pr procurement based on a social economy. So in contrast to the right to consume food, the focus of UN approaches to food security the food sovereignty framework emphasizes the right to produce as a necessary precursor to the right to eat. So to this end, to access the material resources needed to engender a food sovereignty model, including land reform, access to technology, and access to seeds, uh, agrarian social movements have begun to link their demands, these demands for localized resources to local, global, and transnational advocacy networks for social, economic, and cultural human rights. So the Via Campesina, for example, now operates on two distinct fronts, distinct but connected, to address the transnational character of the need to protect the framework of food sovereignty as a human right, the Via Campesina has embarked on a mobilization for an international convention on the rights of peasants. This document was developed through a set of regional and international workshops and conferences between 2000 and 2008 by peasants themselves, so not by lawyers, not by UN officials, and it's now been brought to the UN and, and is being debated in the General Assembly. This, uh, the Convention on Peasants' Rights challenges the inability of current international rights conventions to protect peasants' rights, arguing that the violation of the rights of peasants damages the world's ability to feed itself. On a second front, member organizations are working to implement changes in national constitutional frameworks, legislations, and programs to enact the right of peasants. So food so uh, sovereignty advocates argue that governments have a key responsibility in addressing food insecurity. Food transfers and high food prices haven't combated hunger, especially among the rural poor. So connecting the right to food with the right to produce can make a difference in four critical aspects of food security. Uh, through availability, improving availability of food through strengthening local production chains, 
improving access to food by connecting with local development and alternatives and increasing incomes to purchase food, especially for urban people. Uh, the, the idea of utilization that acknowledge, by acknowledging the negative health effects of the nutrition transition, nutrition transition and the, the turn to a Western diet based on imported food, um, addressing the lack of access to healthy, culturally appropriate foods that has led to a rise in obesity. And finally, the food sovereignty framework addresses the issue of vulnerability. It addresses the impacts of, on local food systems uh, of com the combined food, financial, and energy crises. So food sovereignty advocates suggest that public social safety nets, including school feeding programs and public procurement, government purchasing for hospitals, uh, food banks, schools, etc., can make a difference in stimulating the local supply of culturally appropriate and sustainably produced food, thus affecting availability, access, utilization, and vulnerability. So how has this come out in practice? Uh, here's three examples of where food, the food sovereignty discourse has made its way into national constitutions. Ecuador was one of the first countries to explicitly recognize the right to food sovereignty, and there's many places where it's mentioned in the Ecuadorian constitution. Ecuador hasn't done much to formally implement this right. There's a lot of activity at the grassroots and in the NGO sector, but this is a country where you can see that the establishment of a right hasn't necessarily led to its implementation. In Bolivia, the 2009 constitution has a number of articles that mention food sovereignty, and of interest here has been the emphasis on the obligation of state development policy to preserve food sovereignty, so there's specific references to uh, the, the need to consider food sovereignty uh, issues in negotiating international trade agreements and the need to transfer uh, funds, for example, from the hydrocarbon tax, which under the Morales government have, have more of that revenue has been uh, brought to the Bolivian people that those that revenue specifically is aimed at school feeding programs and other agricultural uh, programs. Brazil, which probably has one of the most advanced food security programs in the world, has recently put a food sovereignty stamp on some of these programs, uh, with food sovereignty language appearing in recent laws, degrees, and, uh, decrees, and programs. So to to finish up, I'm just going to give a couple of examples of food sovereignty initiatives in Bolivia and Brazil that explicitly challenge the ontological separation of the right to food from the right to produce. And then I'm going to give some assessment of the challenges to implementing and domesticating a diversified food sovereignty model based on the principle of international presence rights. So school feeding programs have been in, f in place for some time globally with extensive participation from food aid providers such as the UN uh, World Food Program. Uh, one estimate suggests that in 2008, 22 million children uh, benefited from school subsidized school feeding programs in 70 countries. So we can talk about the, the benefits of school feeding, obviously increasing school attendance, increasing uh, child nutrition uh, for development, and, and actually helping children to uh, stay in school for a longer period. When based on imported food, school feeding does not address, doesn't tend to address, broader community food system breakdowns, leading to, uh, which have resulted in poor nutrition, poor, poor household nutrition in rural communities, especially in the early years of life. And uh, Rachel, I'm sure, will talk about some, some of those important issues. Uh, imported food also doesn't address community resilience, economic development, or land rights. So in response, in very recent years, there's been a shift to the concept of homegrown school feeding, or the idea of supplying local food to schools uh, f that's culturally appropriate, fresher, and more nutritious. Um, so the World, the World Food Program has had a major turnaround on this. Last year, more than 60% of its global budget was allotted to local food purchasing. For example, in Bolivia, World Fo Food Program funds, along with funds transferred to mun municipalities through the hydrocarbon tax, provide purchased rations, but they also provide funds for, for municipalities to purchase food from local farmers. Uh, since 2008, in response to the food price increases, Bolivia has taken some further actions to increase uh, food supplies in local markets as well as stimulate local production. One example of this is a 2011 law called the Law for the Community Agricultural Production Revolution, uh, which includes provisions for strengthening the participation of uh, small farmers, uh, protecting the environment, so payment for ecological services, and improving the consumption and commercialization of small-scale farmer products through uh, through marketing cooperatives and public procurement programs. So is this food sovereignty? I've had a couple of students study this, uh, these programs for their thesis work and, and some of the challenges to looking at a school feeding program in Bolivia from a food sovereignty framework. One is that uh, 
there's such a history of, of providing uh, commodity foods for our schools that there's a system in place that's really hard to break out of. There's also uh, sometimes not access. There isn't sufficient local production to be purchased. That, that the, the agricultural community has suffered such a breakdown that what used to produce, be produced is no longer produced. And then finally, a third, a third challenge was interesting. There was a, a specifically uh, food sovereignty named program that tried to introduce, reintroduce traditional foods like quinoa, amaranth, and, and other native grains into the school breakfast program in El Alto, an urban area in Brazil. And what uh, the evaluations found is the students didn't like that food. They didn't like the traditional food because they had become accustomed to the Western diet, the nutrition transition, and what in Bolivia is known as junk food. So that's a significant challenge to re-establishing a food sovereignty framework when you have communities that have changed their taste, not necessarily for foods that are more nutritious or, or uh, more appropriate for environment and, and social concerns, but it's a very real, anybody who has children know it's really hard to get your kids to eat something that they don't want to eat. So that's a, that's a challenge of re-educating the palate towards a more sustainable food system. So in Brazil, um, well, the struggle for food sovereignty is uh, arguably much more developed. It's uh, Brazilian social movements have been on the front lines of promoting the food sovereignty framework, principally through agrarian social movements working with land reform, uh, participating in the Via Campesina and scaling up their struggle to uh, meet the concerns of urban people in Brazil for uh, more healthy food. Uh, they've ta the Brazilian social movements ta have taken food sovereignty discourse into forest code reform. They've taken it into national pesticide campaigns. There's a, um, a poster here that says the, the poison is on the table. And it sh it sh it's actually a film that's shown in a, in a public education campaign around the, the health impacts of industrial agriculture, particularly around pesticide use. And of course, in Brazil, there's active uh, mobilization around the global land grab, especially around the, the environmental and social implications of the rapid increase in soybean production and, and export. So agrarian movements in Brazil have always demanded uh, a national guarantee of production uh, and, and have asked for the government purchase of, of food for social service programs. And what we've seen is that, um, oh, missing my photo there. But the, the photo that's missing is a photo of the, the, the president of the um, regional uh, food security coalition. And so this is a government uh, council that, that is concerned with food foods actual security uh, programs. And these are called CONSEAS, municipal, state, and national level councils on food security. They've been around since the 1980s. In the last five years, the CONSEAS have had a considerable shift towards a food sovereignty discourse. They, 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 they were not adopting that, that discourse until very recently. And they have been principally responsible for bringing, they're, they're primarily urban, they had been up to this point, primarily urban organizations, and they have been very effective in bringing in um, and connecting peasant demands for guaranteed markets into school feeding and public procurement programs, hospitals, food banks, and popular restaurants. So they collaborated with social movements in the elaboration of a 2006 law that actually requires that 30% of food purchased for schools be purchased from local markets. So really trying to get at that issue of cultural appropriateness, regional foods, regional palates. In Brazil, there's quite a diversity in what people eat in different regions, and they're trying to actually meet that uh, in terms of uh, nutrition and food security. Um, so, for example, the picture that's missing is a, is a picture of the president of the Mato Grosso uh, Council, and she actually works for a child wel welfare NGO, but she meets on a regular basis with people like Fia, who's a member of the Landless Workers Movement, who's standing in her field of papaya plants, which are uh, sold through a cooperative arrangement to local school districts. And then her daughter eats those foods when she goes to school. So it's a really a way of, of closing that separation between the producer and the consumer. So uh, this is an example of homegrown school feeding. Most of you have probably heard of Brazil's uh, social welfare program called Fome Zero or Zero Hunger. Um, fo interestingly, Fome Zero has a huge budget. Its budget is actually, its yearly budget for last year was double the budget of the entire food and agriculture organization of the United Nations about 3.7 billion US dollars. And this includes a lot of programs, including conditional cash transfers for school attendance. But it's also within the same policy package includes credit for small scale farmers, 
It includes public procurement programs that are specifically oriented to agrarian reform settlements, and it includes um, purchasing for food banks from uh, small-scale farmers. So this program overall, including the conditional cash transfers, have been credited with, with bringing 20 million families out of poverty in the last seven years. Part of this is pulling rural people out of poverty by supporting their local uh, agricultural and food systems. So for example, uh, schools will pay more for food that's organically produced. So this facilitates organic certification by small-scale family farmers that may not be able to pursue that certification without that, without, without that extra payment. So what are the challenges to, to this framework in Brazil? Uh, despite this enormous budget of Fome Zero, the elite agricultural uh, and agribusiness sector gets more. For example, between two th 2003 and 2007, state support for large-scale producers in Brazil was about seven times that that was awarded to family form farmers. This is despite the fact that family farmers represent almost 90% uh, almost of Brazil's farmers overall, and they produce about 75% of the, of the food that Brazil actually eats. Brazil is a country that actually is pretty much food self-sufficient. And most of the food that's eaten in Brazil is produced by small-scale farmers. Uh, in 2008, for the 2008-2009 harvest year, um, agri the agribusiness sector, which primarily in Brazil is the sugarcane and soybean sectors, received uh, six times the budget of the Bolsa Familia uh, conditional cash transfer program. And at the same time that we're seeing an increased budget for social we welfare and, and actually strengthening rural agricultural systems, we're seeing a decrease in actual land redistribution and land reform. So if anybody's interested in land reform, I can tell you stories about that. It was one of Lula's main campaign promises to continue distributing land to uh, landless farmers, and it was almost completely halted over the last eight years. Um, so to conclude, uh, food sovereignty is presented as an alternative framework that can uh, uh, pr that, that's a framework that's alternative to the domination of global capital in agri-food systems. It represents an agriculture that can feed the world and cool the planet. It has growing civil society support as a unifying movement that brings together human rights movements, environmental, labor, fair trade, women's, and other progressive movements. Um, uh, the the Via Campesina, which I mentioned, has more than 150 mem members and 150 organizations in 70 countries, 200 million fa farm families, uh, this does not even count the urban supporters and movements that are pushing for this closer link between urban and rural food initiatives, including the examples I gave of school, uh, homegrown school feeding programs. Uh, much has been made of the influence of international trade agreements on national agricultural policies and on, and on increasing world hunger. Of the almost one billion undernourished people in the world, 75% are concentrated in rural areas, and half of these are farming families. The obligations of signatories to the International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights are to take positive actions to ensure the right to food. According to the proposed International Convention on Peasants' Rights, these actions include those that facilitate the right to farm and the right to fair and equitable and environmentally sustainable food production and trading systems. So my research su suggests that the implementation of food sovereignty initiatives that protect the right to produce including the right to agrarian reform and local food system development, represent a strategic shift in protecting the right to food. So thanks very much, Hannah, and I, I really, uh, think that my talk will build on what Hannah was uh, discussing. First of all, I want to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me here. It's really exciting to be in Chicago. This is my second time to Chicago, and I was here 10 years ago, so I, I'm very grateful for the invitation, and it's been a, a lovely day of meeting with students and getting to know more about what you do here. So I have depicted here on this first slide a picture of um, a uh, friend and uh, long-term colleague in Malawi. Um, this uh, talk will focus on my work in southern Africa in a country called Malawi. And her name is Esne Nguira, and she is standing in a field of makuna, which is a leguminous crop that is edible. It's also a cover crop, so it protects the field from soil erosion, and it fixes nitrogen, and when you bury the crop residue, it improves soil fertility. You might be able to see, it's probably hard to see, but she has a slight smile on her face, and I chose this photograph because I think 
it shows a certain amount of dignity and pride in what she's accomplished. She's a, a widow, she has five children, she also looks after several orphans from her uh, siblings who have passed away, and um, she's in her 50s, and she's been able by using different agroecological practices over the last decade to be able to produce enough food for her family and to send her kids to school and to have uh, good nutrition in her home. And she's also uh, openly HIV positive, and so she's really proud of her accomplishments. And she's talked to me about how, how she has felt that taking an agroecological approach to addressing food security is, is, uh, has given her hope and has given her a feeling that she will be able to achieve food security and, and improve nutrition in her household. So I thought it was a good example uh, of a very concrete way that uh, families in uh, very difficult circumstances can achieve food sovereignty uh, in their communities. So I am going to uh, briefly talk about the dominant model of agriculture and the means for achieving food security that you would all be familiar with and then I'm going to spend the majority of my time talking about this alternative approach to addressing food food security and in doing so achieving food sovereignty by using a case study of uh, the work that I've been involved with in Malawi which is a participatory research project that is using sustainable agriculture and agroecological methods to improve uh, food security and nutrition in uh, northern Malawi. And uh, so I'm going to talk about some of our findings and some of our uh, uh, achievements, but at the same time identify some cautions and some uh, future research uh, activities that we have been uh, engaged in in the last few years. So, the dominant model of agriculture is the dominant model of agriculture used here in, in the United States, so I won't spend too much time on it, but it, it is using external inputs uh, that are dependent on petroleum, so fertilizer, pesticides, uh, mechanization, largely monoculture, and uh, to produce a food, and much of that food is produced for export. And this is the model of agriculture that has been uh, dominant in North America and Europe and increasingly in the Global South and it is the one that is advocated by many international institutions as the means to achieve global food security. The uh, logo in the bottom corner here is that of the Alliance for uh, Green Revolution in Africa which is a major multi-million dollar initiative that has been spearheaded uh, in the last six years or so to promote this approach in Africa as a means for achieving food security in Africa. So an alternative approach for addressing food security and one that I'm going to be talking about in reference to the work in Malawi is an agroecological approach and this approach really builds on the way uh, ecological systems operate. So first of all using organic material to improve soil fertility, building soil biota, and uh, using mulch, using crop residues, using manure as a means to improve organic material within your soil. And instead of relying on pesticides, uh, using uh, natural processes, so everything from sticky traps to catching the, as you can see here, catching uh, pests with, uh, with a, a net or using predator-prey uh, interactions, so inter uh, attracting uh, predator insects that will eat the pests that you're having a problem with or intercropping. Uh, so a number of different strategies for addressing pest and disease problems. And then uh, emphasizing resource conservation, so soil conservation, water conservation, and increasing biodiversity as, as a means for achieving uh, food security. And, and finally, your, your overall strategy and, and agroecological strategy is one that draws on what we know about biological systems more generally. So building on synergies within that biological system, uh, looking at the way uh, nutrients are recycled within that system, and uh, enhancing biodiversity as a means to achieve your, your uh, food, food production. And this is an approach which has been promoted by um, most recently by the FAO and by the UN um, representative for the right to food, Olivier de Chute, as the way forward that we should be using as a means to achieve uh, food production globally. Uh, a study done by uh, uh, oh, hundreds of scientists and uh, representatives of government in uh, 2008 uh, called the IAASTD also recommended this approach as really 
the viable way forward for how we can feed our global population. So this isn't, uh, although it's an alternative model, there are many uh, scientists and uh, representatives of different organizations globally who think that this is, this is a viable way that we should move towards in the world. So I'm going to focus on Malawi, and Malawi is interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, it is a highly rural population, so about 85% of people in Malawi rely on their own food production for at least part of their food source. It is a very poor country in southern Africa. The average uh, GDP is about 200 US dollars a year. It is also a maize-based cropping system, which is the dominant cropping system in eastern and southern Africa. So it's a place where you can ask the question, what is the viable way that this population can feed itself? And it's also a place that's quite interesting because in the last six years or so, the government has really spearheaded the dominant model of agriculture as the way forward for feeding the Malawian population. So this is a... Uh, um, poster that was up all over Malawi uh, and the fellow, the man in the right hand uh, side of the picture is the late uh, President uh, Binguwa Metallica. He just passed away this last month um, and uh, of, a, of a heart attack, uh, uh, sadly. But um, while he was president, he uh, initiated a fertilizer subsidy that was a subsidy for both reduced price of fertilizer and reduced price of hybrid maize seed. And he really built his political capital on this subsidy, which reduced the price of fertilizer and hybrid maize seed by uh, two thirds. And it was made widely available to uh, initially the majority of smallholder farmers across Malawi. And initially the international financial institutions were against this uh, policy, but they quickly fell in behind it and along with a lot of donor support. And in doing so, the country became highly indebted and also became in a, a bit of an economic mess. And the last few years, initially, Malawi was trumpeted as a place where hunger had been solved. Um, and it was uh, called the Malawi Miracle. And organizations like AGRA and the Gates Foundation held up Malawi as the way forward for African Africans to feed themselves through fertilizers and uh, hybrid seeds, essentially. Um, but in the last few years, it's faced an economic crisis. There's been a foreign exchange shortage, and there's been a, a major fuel shortage, as well as increasing authoritarianism on the part of the government, which has led people to stand back a little and say, perhaps this approach is not the way forward for a country that has to import all of its fertilizer, and that fertilizer is increasingly expensive. So one of the reasons why Malawi is interesting, not only for those of us who work there, but for people more generally interested in food security, is because you see uh, very uh, much questions about what is the best way to feed a population that is quite poor and that has tried different models for addressing food security. So the work that I've been involved with for the last 12 years is based out of a hospital in northern Malawi. And it really began to grapple with the question of uh, food security from a child malnutrition standpoint. So in the late 90s, you saw the rising price of fertilizer, in part because of economic policies imposed by uh, the IMF and the World Bank on Malawi. And farmers who had come to rely on fertilizer found that they were unable to produce enough food for their families. And they were admitting children with severe malnutrition to the hospital. And the hospital was looking for alternatives to fertilizer as a means for supporting food security in their community. And so uh, we developed a pilot project initially to test alternative options for addressing food security. And these options were sort of a basket of options that had been tested on research stations and in controlled conditions on farm, but hadn't been really tried out by farmers under their own farming conditions. And the idea was it was going to be a pilot project uh, where farmers would learn these different options and then experiment with them on their own farms. And then we would track to see what the outcomes were, not only in terms of soil fertility and food security, but particularly the hospital was interested in child nutrition outcomes. And so initially, we trained uh, 30 members of what we called the pharma research team who learned about these different options. And then anyone in their seven villages could join the project and learn about them and test them on their own field. And there were also village plots where farmers could see all the options displayed. And those plots were managed by the pharma research team. We also had field days, we had farmer exchanges, we had farmer apprenticeship days, we had recipe days. So many different sort of teaching opportunities that were really based on farmer to farmer community based approaches. 
And we had a, a longitudinal design, so we are doing both pre and post as well as control intervention uh, design model so we could compare how the situation was changing for farmers, both in comparison to their neighbors, but also com in comparison to where they were at the beginning of the project. And we used all kinds of different measures, everything from agricultural uh, measures to measuring ch children's weight and height to interviewing farmers about what changes they were seeing in their community. And it was an iterative process, so as things came up that we realized we need to be tracking this, we also included some additional measures as, as required. And we did a lot of participatory workshops to check in with farmers about what they were experiencing. So what were these different options that people were trying out on their fields? This is a picture of a woman who's growing pigeon pea, and uh, that's the tall, shrubby legume in the background. It's uh, uh, a legume that is sort of a woody shrub, and it produces a small pea that is edible. You can also use it for fodder for your goats or cattle. Uh, it has deep roots that pull up nutrients from deep below the surface and help other crops growing in the area. And it's nitrogen fixing, so if you bury the leaves then and, and the roots, then you have uh, nutrients available to maize the following year, to corn the following year. Um, in uh, addition, people grow intercropped with that groundnuts or soybean, and groundnuts is in this picture, that's peanut, and uh, both of them are harvested, they're harvested at different times of the year, and that's another advantage of this system. You harvest groundnut earlier, so you have a nice uh, protein-rich, oil-rich food available er earlier in the season that also has legume or residue that you can bury in the field to improve the soil fertility, and then later on in the season you harvest pigeon pea, so you have an extension of the season. And you rotate this combination with maize so that you have crop rotation, which also reduces problems of disease and weeds as well. In, in essence, it's quite a simple uh, option, and, uh, but you're building on agro agroecological princi principles and using this, in using this option. And this was the most popular option. There were a number of different options that farmers could choose from, but they liked this one the best because these two crops are edible. So you're not setting aside a field and just growing something that's going to improve soil fertility down the road. You're, you're growing food at the same time that you're improving soil fertility, which is really viable for farmers where the average land uh, availability is about 1.1 hectares per household. And what we were able to track is that farmers were really excited by these options. I didn't include a graph of the number of people who joined the project, but we started with about 185 farmers in the year 2000. And by 2004, we had over 2,000 farmers who had joined the project. And we now have thousands of farmers who have received a small amount of seed and a little bit of training and then have taken it from there. And what this graph shows is that they were quite willing to expand the area devoted to legumes over time. And, uh, and depending on the type of legume, uh, depended on how much they expanded it. We also found differences by gender in terms of how much they were able to expand it. And we are also able to demonstrate improvements in maize yield. So you're not just increasing legume availability, but you're also increasing your, your primary grain crop, not only in comparison to just not using fertilizer, but in comparison to <coughs> maize plus fertilizer alone. So it, it is addressing food security at the same time that it's improving the quality of the diet. And what farmers started to talk about as well is that this isn't just a means to improve soil fertility and food security, but in years when we have drought or poor rain, our soils that have been improved by these legumes are responding better to uh, the poor rains. Um, be, and that makes sense from a scientific perspective because the, the soils have more organic matter, which means they're better able to retain moisture under times of drought stress. And, and so what we've been able to document is that these, this simple, in some ways very simple strategy of incorporating a number of different crops that are leguminous into your cropping system, so using biodiversity as one of your strategies to address food security, has multiple benefits. And so this, this graph shows you're increasing soil cover, so that reduces soil erosion. You're increasing protein available within the household. VCR is value cost ratio, so you're reducing the price of the farming system to the household because you're not purchasing as much fertilizer. If you do use fertilizer, that fertilizer is utilized more efficiently by the plant because the soil is better able to retain the nutrients and retain water, and so it's, you use less fertilizer when you do use fertilizer, and you still are able to maintain uh, grain yield. So uh, another aspect we looked at is are people 
maintaining high levels of crop diversity over time. And uh, this uh, table shows that there's a statistically significant difference in terms of the number of farmers who have increased the number of crops they grow compared to control households. And these are farmers who may have joined the project on average they joined eight years ago and they're, they're still maintaining a higher number of crops in their farming system. And farmers are relating this notion of crop diversity also to climate change because they say when we grow more crops, if one fails because of poor rains one year, um, that, then we're better off. If the next year there's heavy rains, another crop might do better. So this is an important strategy for uh, conditions of uncertain rainfall. Um, we also identified uh, social issues that you really need to pay attention to in relation to the, this strategy. Um, so there were a number of social issues we identified. I'm going to talk about uh, two. One of them was it, we were saying to farmers, in order for this to improve soil fertility, you need to bury the crop residue early uh, after harvest. Normally it's women who harvest the legumes. Uh, and normally it's men who prepare the fields for planting just before the planting period. So in asking them to bury the crop residue early, we are either asking women to take on a new task during the harvest period, or we are asking them to go home to their husbands and say, honey, do you mind going to the field and burying that crop residue now because it's going to improve the soil fertility. And in a, in a country where you have very unequal division of labor, you have high levels of domestic violence. And in northern Malawi, land is passed through men, so women aren't considered to be owners of the land. So men have a lot of control over the decision making within households. That's a lot to ask women to do. And so initially, we were not seeing high levels of uh, crop residue incorporation. What the farmer research team said was, well, we need to organize some promotion of this. So they went, they said, we're going to have crop residue promotion days and they went to the villages uh, as a team and said okay folks today's crop residue promotion day come see what we're going to do hey men take a look at this we're burying the crop residue of this legume because this is your fertilizer hey this is your job this is your fertilizer it's worth little a lot of money you should bury the crop residue it sounds simple it sounds you know kind of silly but this is what they organized and we were able to track over time a very dramatic shift in agricultural practice. This is from 2009, but we've consistently seen this result where farmers were bearing crop residue early in households that were participating in this project and in control households in neighboring villages, they continued to burn the crop residue just before planting. So another social issue that was quite important was they were, initially we were seeing high, you know, increases in legume production, but women were saying at the workshops, well, this isn't really helping us out because our husbands, sorry, Ben, but it, it was the husbands were taking the ground nuts and they were selling it and using it for beer or for other, uh, other things that weren't a benefit to the household. And so we, uh, a lot, there were a lot of other sensitive kind of household and community issues that came up in our, in our work. And so we decided to organize what we called agriculture and nutrition discussion groups, which brought together older men, older women, younger men, younger women, to talk about some of these issues, initially in the small group, only with someone of your own age and gender, and then through a facilitated uh, means, discussing it in the larger group to try to raise some of these bigger issues. And we found that the, this was a, a kind of, revolutionary idea in some ways because farmers hadn't had that opportunity. People hadn't had that opportunity to have this kind of unstructured sharing of ideas in, in that way. It was, it was different for them, particularly across gender. That wasn't very common. Having men sit around talking about you know, ways to improve child nutrition, that was quite unique. And uh, they also found that it was a means to bring up some of these difficult issues in, in, uh, in, uh, safe, in safe ways. And so what we have found is that this combination of an agroecological approach combined with paying attention to some of these difficult household and community issues through different educational strategies has been effective at addressing child nutrition. And what this graph shows is that uh, weight for age, and we found the same with weight for height uh, for child growth, uh, is improved both before and after people are involved with the project, but also compared to intervention households. And this was a very exciting result for us because it's, uh, there aren't many studies that, it, that have been able to demonstrate that agricultural interventions can lead to improvements in child nutrition. So another component of this kind of agroecological uh, strategy that really 
draws on notions of food sovereignty is that of community organizing. So the farmers have organized a community seed legume or a community seed bank for legume seeds, which when you join the project, you have to pay back the following year uh, the seed that you received. So after you've had one growing season, that seed goes into the seed, seed bank and it becomes, it gets distributed by the farmer research team to other members of the community. They've also organized um, a uh, um, Equindeni Farmer Association, which is a, a cooperative which helps them to get reasonable prices for their crops. And in this picture, you see a kiln that they built. Uh, this was just this past year, which they used to make fuel efficient uh, wood stoves, which they distributed to everyone in their community as one way of addressing uh, climate change. Um, so a couple of cautions before you get too excited. We've also found in our, in our research increasing in e entry of uh, corporate interest into Malawian farms uh, through the seed. So uh, an increasing number of farmers are reliant on hybrid maize seed and they're buying that hybrid maize seed from the four multinational seed companies that sell seed in Malawi. And uh, this is in large part because of the fertilizer subsidy in the, in the last uh, six years. Um, a lot of uh, our work in the last few years is focused on climate change and we did some interviews with farmers and survey work on what are their perceptions of climate change and farmers are talking about some very dramatic changes in uh, rainfall patterns. So rains that used to come no longer come. They had special names. They came in June and they came in September and October. They no longer come. When the planting rains come, they come later and they finish earlier. And when they do come, sometimes there's a break of two or three weeks where they, there is no rain. And so under these conditions, it's, it's very difficult to sustain food security. And certainly these uh, findings, which are farmer perceptions of rainfall, um, would be consistent with what is predicted for Sub-Saharan Africa uh, with uh, rising greenhouse gas emissions, and, and namely increased droughts, increased severity of droughts, and increased unreliability of, of rainfall. Um, and I, I've mentioned uh, gender inequalities as a major concern and something to really pay attention to if you want to address food sovereignty. Uh, we also have, in the case of Malawi and many, many parts of Southern Africa, very high rates of HIV prevalence and a lot of other health issues, uh, be it malaria or diarrhea or so on. We asked this question two years ago during the last growing season, did you or anyone in your household fall sick for one week such that it affected your agricultural activities? And fi about 50% of people said yes. So that is something that we really need to pay attention to in thinking about how to achieve uh, food security and food sovereignty using these approaches. And uh, I've spoken a bit about some of the concerns of women more specifically with regards to how household resources are used and this is a quote from a, an interview I did in 2009, which really addresses that. This woman is saying, I'm worried about what will happen when my husband sells the crops because he'll take the money and use it for his own benefit. And I'm also worried that he's going to sleep around and he'll bring HIV into the home. So these are an ongoing concern that we need to pay attention to. Um, I'm, I've been involved for the last four years, or last two years, in, in a long-term project where we're looking at climate change adaptation strategies. I won't talk much about that because I want to make sure Phil has time to talk, but um, uh, one of the ongoing research activities is looking at different ideas farmers have around climate change adaptation, and one of them is trees. So they've organized community tree nurseries in the last two years in 20 different villages and distributed uh, tree seedlings to hundreds of farmers in the area, and they see this as one strategy for addressing climate change in their communities. And they're also interested in small uh, livestock integration as a, as a backup plan if the rains are really poor that year. So this is a uh, piggery that they built that they're pointing to and it's a communal piggery um, where they're keeping pigs and, they're, and um, it's, it's kept for the village. So I'll end with this slide um, and uh, it's similar to the first slide. Um, it's a picture of Chrissy Mbuluma and I took this picture just in January. And uh, she's also HIV positive, and she's standing in her field of pigeon pea and soybean. And she said she didn't find the work too onerous. She found it viable. And um, at the time, at times when she was feeling sick, she said the people within the project helped her do the weeding of the field. So she found that cooperative effort really important for maintaining food security. And the, she received one of the stoves that people made 
And she said that was really helpful when it was cold. It helped keep her warm. So I, I'm concluding with this slide because I have cautious optimism about emerging alternatives to the dominant model of agriculture in the world. And although I'm aware of the multiple forces that can work against those uh, alternatives, um, and I'm also aware of the importance of taking gender and other inequalities seriously at the household and community level, um, I, I would conclude from our work that using agroecological methods to improve uh, food security increases local control, sustainability, and resilience of the food system, and thus is a food sovereignty approach. And uh, by building farmer knowledge and paying careful attention to lo local inequalities, we can have a uh, place that experiences food sovereignty. So thanks very much. Well, good afternoon and thank you all for coming. Uh, I'd like to thank Jamie for taking care of us so well and um, Kathy for taking care of us up here with the questions afterwards. Uh, maybe if I talk long enough, we won't have time for those. Um, I wanted to address this global conundrum. I um, will start with a couple of, oh, I've just realized I've got this, this uh, device. I'll, I'm gonna start with a couple of um, devices, a couple of um, slides. The first one is, a slide that gives you some sense of who's feeding the world. I think this is a very dramatic um, distribution and it's very easy for us in the industrialized regions of the world to forget that 50% uh, of the world's cultivated food is produced by peasants and then of course there's 12.5 uh, coming from forests etc and 7.5 from urban food which I'll talk about in a minute. I also want to show this picture here that captures the inequality in the world. This is from Anki Hoogveldt's work and it gives you some sense of the inequality that uh, the world currently has and I think it's quite extraordinary when you, when you, when you stop and look at that, that um, those of us with credit cards belong in, in the middle, the bankable crew and we're surrounded by um, these two other categories. Now the reason I'm putting these two slides back to back has to do with this kind of comment and that is that um, that 70% that of peasant provisioning exists on the margins of the corporate market system that we've been talking about so far. But a growing portion of that 70% may well be the, uh, the key to surviving the future. I just came up from Detroit this morning. Yesterday I spent the afternoon, I'm, I'm working with a group of people from different sites around the country on urban agriculture, which is not my speci speciality. I don't know very much about it, but I'm learning. Um, but we, view, we visited the D-Town farm and the Detroit Black Food Security Network met with us last night to talk about what was going on in Detroit. And what I picked up just from that quick experience was this very, really strong sense of bringing the countryside to the post-industrial city. In many ways, Detroit represents, um, in some people's minds, an image of America's future, where uh, with jobs going offshore, with unemployment rising, with more and more cities with unemployed or underemployed populations and hungry populations, people are going to resort to this kind of um, local feeding program that uh, Detroit so clearly represents. And what they talked about last night with us was the whole process of reskilling urban youth to sort of reconnect with, with the land. And we have to remember that anyone who lives in a city um, intergenerationally eventually came, uh, you know, originally came from the land. And so what they're trying to do is to sort of recapture uh, that connection with the land, but in the city. Um, and build neighborhoods and communities around that whole process as part of what I would argue is food sovereignty. So my argument today is that food sovereignty represents a paradigm change. Food sovereignty redefines food security from a trade-based to a rights-based concept and practice. That nations and communities should have the right to consume rather than trade 
the food that they produce, and that farming and indigenous peoples should have land rights to secure farming practices, local food provisioning for fellow citizens, and to encourage, encourage ecological stewardship of the kind that both Hannah and Rachel have talked about. Now the conundrum for me is that just as the right to food, that's food sovereignty, emerges as a powerful vision, it's competing now with an alternative investor-driven right to food, which I'm characterizing as the, the global land grab. And what I'm arguing here is that there's a global infrastructure of agro-exporting that I, I think Hannah mentioned in her talk earlier, um, which I'm calling the right to trade, and that's institutionalized within the WTO's agreement on agriculture. It's facilitating a land enclosure by foreign firms and states that's ensuring a new mercantilist vision of food security, which is overriding the free trade system via direct investment in offshore food production. So instead of firms and countries relying on the, the market, they're actually going offshore and directly capturing um, access to, to land so they can grow food and biofuels and what have you, and I'll talk about that. So what I'm arguing is that the land grab reformulates food security as a neoliberal atavism, and by that I mean that um, ne neoliberalism is about the market, of course, and I'm arguing that um, these guys are overriding the market, um, but I'm also arguing that neoliberalism has, um, has opened up countries, particularly indebted African countries, Latin American and Asian countries to a lesser extent, to the attractions of foreign investors coming in and leasing and, and purchasing their land. And so there's a very interesting conundrum that's associated with this whole process. So what was food security? Well, well Hannah talked a little bit about this and I'm not going to go over it very much. She mentioned the, um, the vision that emerged after World War II and the FAO certainly had a, a notion of a kind of a, a decommodified understanding of um, getting food to people who were hungry across the world in the post-colonial period. But that vision shifted to feeding the world with agro-technologies and dietary and nutritional sciences and the whole emphasis on calories that, um, that Hannah mentioned also. Uh, the key shift, I think, was that the US overrode the U um, UNRWA, which is the United Nations um, Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, and the World Food Board in 1946 um, that were supposed to be public agencies sort of managing food aid as well as managing the, food, the world food system um, and substituting a bilateral PL Public Law 480 food aid, food aid regime by which the United States by this time um, as a consequence of the um, coming out of the 1930s depression and the stabilization of American agriculture after the Dust Bowl in the 30s, um, the US was producing huge surpluses of food and so one of the, the convenient ways of dumping that those surpluses was to sell it, to sell those surpluses at concessional prices to strategic states on the Cold War perimeter in the third world. States like Korea, South Korea, India, Pakistan, Israel, Egypt, Colombia um, and so forth. And so it became a very effective way of, of getting food to those countries to, um, to, to essentially pacify urban populations, to, um, to, to build loyalty, um, and in George McGovern's words in the late 1960s, to, um, to anticipate future markets once those countries became, once those cultures became um, addicted to, to Western foods, and, and Hannah explained that process also. And that's in, in fact what happened. Um, so after the food aid regime was set up um, to redistribute U.S. food surpluses, the Europeans then copied that model because through the Marshall Plan, the U.S. had, um, had brought the American industrial food system to Europe. Um, and so by the 1970s, Europe was beginning to produce surpluses itself. And so there became this kind of big trade war between the U.S. and the Europeans, which has continued today, up to today. Um, and during this period also the Green Revolutions were set in place in the, in the 60s in particular, um, growing staples um, for urban populations, grains in particular, um, and then followed with um, genetically modified technologies um, later on with um, high value foodstuffs that um, have produced this kind of global uh, supermarket that we're now very familiar with. Um, and so th those are all part of the, the, the uh, agro-export infrastructure. 
1974, uh, there was a, a crisis, a world food crisis, for some of, some of us in the audience will remember that food prices shot up um, at the same time as oil prices were, were going up. Um, now food insecurity um, had, um, had emerged from the collapse of this food regime. In other words, what had happened was the US was selling more and more of its surplus foods to Russia, to the Soviet Union rather, um, through an agreement by President Nixon. And of course that took food away from the third world countries and, and prices shot up in, in the Western world. And so there was a, a new um, World Food Summit that, that um, was established in 74. The World Food Program was set up to provide aid. And then on the side, parallel um, complementing that was the, the elaboration of a, um, um, a trading system where the uh, general agreement on trade and tariffs met in the mid-1980s to try and stabilize the uh, international food trade because the US and the Europeans were trying to you know, dominate different markets and they were competing with one another and, and prices were incredibly volatile. So that Uruguay round that began in 1986 um, culminated in 1994 and then in 1995 the WTO with the agreement on agriculture was set up to sort of institutionalize and stabilize this whole process of agro-exporting from the global north. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details of that right now. But the dominant ideology underlying this uh, was essentially articulated at the beginning of the Uruguay round in 1986. And, and this, I, I would argue, represents the, the notion of food security as a um, privatized system whereby food is moved from granaries or bread baskets in the north uh, through the device of transnational food corporations to um, hungry people and countries in the global south. That's essentially how, how the system is set up. Um, another way of looking at it is um, the issue of dumping, which I'll come back to. So what's interesting is that during this period that um, public expenditure on agriculture in the global south fell 50%. And those figures are quite extraordinary. If you look at the direct payments to OECD farmers, that's the, the northern farmers, in 2006, 125 billion um, just in one year, whereas only 3.9 billion are going to the um, public expenditure going to the global south. Um, the World Bank in its uh, report in 2007 actually admitted uh, deep, in the, uh, deep in, the, in the report that um, structural adjustment programs established in the 1980s um, and, through the, th and through to the present day uh, essentially dismantled the elaborate system of public agencies supporting uh, small farmers in the global south. Now what's interesting about this whole process is that agriculture uh, was off the radar now from, the, from 1980 right through until 2007 when the World Bank's World Development Report, which comes out annually, refocused on agriculture. After 25 years of ignoring agriculture, all of a sudden it came back into the centre of um, World Bank reporting and of course this was a period of uh, food price crisis and, and um, food riots etc. It was a happy coincidence but I, I think it um, tells us something about how agriculture and food are really um, returning to, to the centre um, and we're beginning to recognise that in fact agriculture is the foundation of civilization in, in, um, in several different ways. So um, this cheap food regime I'd mentioned about the dumping and what's interesting about that, and I think this was mentioned earlier, that what I call the corporate food regime was a system whereby subsidies in the north paid for by taxpayers enabled food, food to, surplus food to be dumped at artificially lowered prices in the global south, driving farmers off the land. Um, and this low price was institutionalized by the WTO and it has led to the displacement of smallholders going to slums or agro-export estates. 1990s, the FAO figures um, were, were conservative. Um, Hannah mentioned 30 million. I'm, I'm being um, uh, a bit more conservative here, here saying 20 to 30 million. Mexico, um, the f figures are about 2 million campesinos dispossessed since um, NAFTA was brought in, the North, North American Free Trade Agreement in 1994. Um, it's quite extraordinary, you know, the debate about um, so-called illegal immigration from Mexico into this country always ignores the, um, um, the enabling factors which have to do with the, um, the reduction of support for Mexican farmers um, as a consequence of signing onto NAFTA by the Mexican government, the 
privatization of communal lands, which were established after the Mexican Revolution earlier in the 20th century. Um, the incredibly heavily subsidized corn coming from Iowa um, that is dumped in the Mexican markets, making it very difficult for small farmers to compete um, in the market. So, so these are all fascinating um, structural um, forces that um, have, have wrought um, considerable havoc on the um, small farmers across the world. Um, so we have this crisis conjuncture I alluded to earlier, smallholders on their heels, rising hunger, hunger levels, rising food and energy prices, food riots, global warming, financiers looking for non-industrial profit frontiers, development institutions looking for re-legitimation. The markers of this period, I think it's fascinating that all of these reports, and this is not all of them, but these are the key ones, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment came out in 2005, the Stern Review in 2006, and, and um, um, the Stern Review made the point that climate change was the greatest market failure of all time. Um, and the World Development Report I just mentioned, which refocused on agriculture, the International Assessment of Agricultural Science and Technology for Development report came out in 2008, and Hannah mentioned that, and then the World Food Summit in Rome in 2008, uh, which I went to, but I was part of the alternative forum, the Terra Preta forum, which um, was, was sort of meeting alongside the, um, the big shots. Um, I mean, we did have an audience um, in, in the FAO, FAO, but this was a meeting of um, CSOs, social movements, um, agrarian land rights movements, etc. And what we were trying to do was to put pressure on the FAO and the World Bank and the, the corporate leaders to take very seriously this crisis in food prices and um, it was pretty much met with, with deaf ears just as the ISTAD report was also because uh, as, as um, both Hannah and Rachel have mentioned, I think agroecology was a, a central part of the ISTAD report, basically arguing that um, um, business as usual is no, is no longer an option. That's a direct quote from the report. Uh, and it's in this context that uh, land grabbing exploded. Um, and um, by this year, over 200 million acres, I think Hannah mentioned 227 acres, approximately the area of Western Europe. gives you an idea of the spiking of land grabbing. I mean, land grabbing is not new. We know that it um, was, was um, central to colonialism. And of course, we're sitting on grabbed land right here in, in Chicago. Um, and I'm, I'm from Australia. And um, of course, I'm very conscious of um, the fact that um, the white settlers grabbed the land in 1788. Um, but nevertheless, I think there's something very unique and different about this particular land grab that's going on today. Um, well, in the middle of the food crisis, the New York Times had this editorial, which I th always find fascinating because they made the point that um, cooking oil um, became too expensive for very poor families um, who grow much of their own food but have to buy oil in which to cook it. Now, you're probably wondering why I'm um, bringing this up. Well, if you look at um, uh, crude oil and palm oil here, and palm oil is um, cooking oil, right? You look at the, um, from 2007, essentially, um, they are totally connected um, in, in the, um, uh, those, this, this sort of synch synchrony of, of prices, which tells you something about how um, food and energy um, has become incredibly integrated now. And what's interesting about that is that um, Hannah pointed out that um, um, industrial agriculture is so dependent on fossil fuels. I mean, it's extraordinary when Al Gore came out with his inconvenient truth. I don't know if you remember, but there was no mention of agriculture in there. And agriculture has been measured as being responsible for at least 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so what that t tells us is not that Al Gore was ignorant, but that public discourse about the role of agriculture um, has been um, remarkably ignorant. And then Jeffrey Sachs came out with a new book called Commonwealth, and uh, I didn't buy it, but I went to a bookstore and looked it up, um, <laughs> and found that uh, when, he was, when he was measuring the sources of greenhouse gas emission, no mention of agriculture, and this is a couple of years later. It's extraordinary. Um, so it just tells us about urban civilization that we totally ignore the land where our food comes from, because it, it comes from the fridge, right? Or from Walmart, or wherever. You know what I'm getting at. So um, this, is, this is quite an interesting graph put together by a grad student of mine. 
Now, oil palm, you can see, um, is a um, sort of classic industrial crop. And what's interesting is that oil palm is used for cooking oil. It's also used for biodiesel. So palm oil, the principal cooking oil produced in Southeast Asia, now doubles as biodiesel to supply the rising European demand for green energy. And the Europeans have mandated that 10% um, of their energy um, has to come from, from biodiesel by 2020. First paradox, food necessities for the poorest in the global south become fuel <coughs> for energy intensive northern consumers. Paradox two, the policies addressing energy and climate crises encouraging biodiesels, diesel, exacerbate food and environmental crisis. It's been shown that biofuels other than um, sugar um, essentially don't produce um, sufficient alternative energy to offset the, the emissions that um, those industrial crops produce. Um, and that's, you know, that's quite extraordinary to think about that, that we, we're talking about using these alternative green fuels when in fact we're not really solving the, um, the emissions problem. But we're also upsetting the environment even more with the industrial crops and we're taking food away from hungry people. So the US also has its mandates for um, biofuels. And um, this gives you some sense of the, <coughs> the externalities that are associated with biofuels. Um, this is just telling you, giving you some sense of the figures associated with corn production, the extraordinary um, influence that US traded corn has on world corn prices. And when um, the US government under George Bush uh, mandated uh, rising ethanol use in this country, um, corn prices, I mean corn distilleries uh, went nuts. Um, corn prices, well they didn't go nuts, they went corn, but um, they, um, uh, corn, <laughs> corn prices shot up and um, farmers who are growing wheat and soy shift to corn also because they're getting subsidies for this, they're getting high prices for it. So it has this kind of cascading effect and this is one of the reasons why the um, price spike in 2007-2008 was so dramatic. And those are the estimates there. The World Bank estimated uh, the US responsible for 65% of um, agflation. I can't remember which it was, who it was, Hannah or, or Rachel mentioned um, farmers, Hannah, I said, uh, Hannah, Hannah said that far, the trickle down effect of high, high prices for food didn't reach the small farmers. Um, those that did um, did have the trickle down effect, found that um, they were being swamped by rising uh, seed, fertilizer and agrochemical prices. I mean the profits that were made by the agribusiness company during that crisis were extraordinary and I, I don't have the figures right here but uh, if someone wants them I can get them. Um, this I think sort of captures the, uh, the issue of biofuels that um, I like to call them agrofuels to remind us that um, they're about um, displacing food crops. But the underlined sections, I think, are, are important because they, they show, I think, the way in which um, an open market system in the, in the world f food regime and the, these mandates for biofuels um, naturally lead investors to invest in biofuels at the expense of uh, local populations um, having access to, to their own to, to food that they could grow. So here's your average Chicagoan, right? We don't have these kind of people in Ithaca. <laughs> um, so in the context of this, the land grab becomes uh, in increasingly important and, and um, people are developing coalitions to, to address and fight the, the, the land grab. Um, I'm, I'm involved in trying to set up a, um, a land an anti-land grab consortium in the Americas um, later on this summer um, because I think that we feel that it's a, it's a really um, threatening vector that uh, is, is, uh, threatens to undermine the um, progress that's been made by food sovereignty movements around the world. This gives you some sense of the um, states that are buying and leasing land 
and here we're looking particularly at the East Asian countries and the Middle Eastern countries that are concerned to obtain sufficient food to pacify their urban populations in particular. And if you think about the Arab Spring, a good deal of the Arab Spring was um, caused by rising food prices and one only needs to go back and look at the history, the recent history of Egyptian agriculture and see the way in which the Egyptian gov government has substituted uh, feed grain production and livestock production within Egypt um, and has imported more and more of its basic grains from offshore so that um, what's being produced in Egypt is feeding relatively wealthy consumers and the poorer consumers are dependent on food importing which of course becomes problematic when prices go up and the big food exporting countries like Argentina and Vietnam and Russia um, in particular um, put export bans on in order to retain the food for their own population. So the, the whole process has again this cascading effect which is quite fascinating. So the new land grab, the patterns are over the last decade 60% has gone into biofuels, 20% to food, 20% to other areas. 70% um, of land grabbing is taking place in Africa. Um, 2007 biofuels were the fastest growing segment of world agricultural market um, and it's quite extraordinary that um, um, my teacher's insurance pension fund um, is investing in the land grab and um, so um, I'm a land grabber also. So the world food crisis led to these export bans, intensified land grabbing um, and the land grab is capitalizing these new agro-export zones of bioresource grabs, speculative profit, and carbon offsets that I'll mention. So here's another one. Um, last year in the New York Times, Oxfam produced this report showing that uh, this particular company that puts up eucalyptus plantations to sell carbon credits to polluters back in Europe was enabled by the Ugandan state to evict 20,000 people from their land. And this is not an isolated pattern, an isolated episode. This is becoming a pattern. There's a new plan um, in, um, in, the, in the works to, 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 um, to exchange African soil for carbon credits. In other words, for investors to invest in improving small farmer productivity around conservation farming um, in return for carbon credits, which will, which will be sold on the carbon market to polluters Back in, back in Europe. Um, it's an extraordinary um, connection um, that, that uh, actually puts agriculture at the service of this fictitious carbon market, which is really not um, helping to reduce carbon emissions. But it's financially very profitable. So you have states in the World Bank helping to reclassify peasant land. You have offshore investment by finan financiers, and you have these um, interesting conglomerates, um, this recombinant capital um, across auto, energy, chemical, agribusiness companies, and they're investing in these different commodities. And it doesn't really matter what commodity you're investing in. You invest in the commodity that commands the highest price, and what I call this sort of indiscriminate um, cropping because what it's basically saying is that um, what's being produced on the land, it doesn't really matter so long as it's profitable. And this has a huge impact, obviously, on, on hunger. At these are some of the bioeconomy products that are part of this um, bioeconomy that's emerging. It's becoming very profitable. There's a shift that's going on away from the fossil fuel economy, the attempt to use plant-based um, products to, um, as substitutes. Now the bioresource grab that I've been talking about uh, represents a transition from, and this incredibly elegant quote from Via Campesina, the massive movement of food around the world is causing the increased movement of people. Back in 2000 they said that. And I'm arguing that uh, we should be rephrasing that now to the massive movement of capital or carbon credits around the world is forcing the increased movement of people. I mean the two things are working together obviously. But it's interesting to think about what's happening um, in that regard, it's, it's not so much about food anymore, it's, it's, it's more about what you can um, earn, what, what kind of value you can get from the land. There's inst institutionalization of these various codes of conduct, which I don't have time to talk about. The RAI is the Responsible Agricultural Investment, 
principles that the World Bank has hammered out. The voluntary guidelines are being put forward by the FAO in a much more progressive way. They're looking after gender equity issues. Um, they're trying to privilege small farmers um, to protect land tenure um, on the part of um, farming communities and, and common lands and things like that. Um, but these are only voluntary guidelines. They don't have the force of law. Um, the UN Rights Rapporteur uh, has, has referred to this code of conduct production as responsibly destroying the, the world's peasantry, which I think captures the point very well. Um, this is just a quote from the voluntary guidelines to regulate land grabbing that just came in this year in March. And you'll notice that um, everything is voluntary. Um, it's, 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 it's in the language of obligations and um, down the bottom, the, the voluntary guidelines are designed to strengthen the recognition of customary profit, property tenure and address gender in, inequity. Now, I'm showing you this slide because I think that the, the guidelines represent um, certainly an advancement on the World Bank's RAI principles, um, but they also signal um, a huge struggle that's going on in the FAO um, that has to do with protecting the rights of smallholders across the world. And this is my last major slide here. The FAO is undergoing these deliberations, and I see, and I've been involved in these in part, um, not, a, not on a big scale, but um, I, I've, it's, it's been very interesting to watch this unfold in the last two or three years. There's a promising trend to protect small farmers. Um, the Committee on Food Security was rebuilt about two or three years ago, and um, it's part of the FAO. And the, uh, what's interesting about that is that they, instead of just having member states have votes, they now allow civil society organisations to have a voice in that committee, uh, which I think is an extraordinary de development which uh, was pioneered or pushed, driven by the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty uh, securing this right to food principle. And then we have the Human Rights Rapporteur on the WTO reform arguing that provisions of the A the agreement on agriculture uh, treat food security as a deviation from the objective of agricultural trade liberalisation. So his whole shtick right now is to argue that the AOA um, is, is now redundant and that uh, it needs to sort of catch up to the post-food crisis world that we're experiencing right now. And he's pushing the minimum human rights principle, the question for whose benefit is at least as important as the question how to produce more. And I'm finishing off by making the point that ironically the land grab threat is concentrating the paradox of industrial agriculture by empowering a global forum in Rome as well as food sovereignty movements as a paradigmatic alternative. And somebody asked me to make some mention of uh, the food sovereignty movement in, in the United States, so I took this from their recent platform. Um, and. Um, it's pretty much, pretty, pretty similar, I think, to some of the ideas of food sovereignty that both Hannah and Rachel have talked about, but um, very much emphasizing the importance of um, anti-racist movements in the urban centers in this country. And uh, that is Malik Yalini in the top right corner there. Um, he's the uh, sort of director of the, um, the uh, Detroit, the D-Town, urban farm that I visited yesterday. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, that was really great. And I, I know you all three know each other, but uh, you should feel free to speak, talk amongst yourselves mm -hmm. as well. Um, so I have lots of questions, and we don't have much time, so I'll just ask a couple of them. But I want to start with, um, a more sort of broad conceptual question about the um, idea of food sovereignty as, as a framework. And one thing you know, that's really striking about the, um, the, the, the discourse around it is a kind of close attention to specificity. That is a close attention to place, to um, community, environment, to history, right? So to argue that not all you know, food, for example, is equal, right? That, um, Food has locality, it has history, it has um, community. And so what this introduces, obviously, is the sense that there's an alternative value system, right? There are other kinds of values um, that come into play in addition to values which can be reduced to quantities, right? So whether that quantity is money, 
or that quantity is calories, right, that there is a kind of irreducible irre historical, cultural, or local kind of element, right? And that strikes me as a kind of interesting parallel to discussions in environmental, uh, environmentalist circles, right, where there have been attempts in, in order to sort of sell the value of natural environments to put a value, a dollar value on you know, ecosystem services, right? So to actually reduce these you know, quite incommensurate value systems to a kind of number in an economic discourse, and, um, and which completely loses the specificity of a particular location, for example, to say that the ecosystem services of this wetland are such and such. It, it says nothing about what it means to communities or what it looks like or, you know, the, you know how, how you met your first boyfriend there, or whatever you know the story is. Um, so I wonder um, if there, how the um, sort of dominant paradigm, if if this is at all, if you have some commentary on sort of engaging the dominant paradigm of food security with uh, ways of doing it without losing this kind of um, sense of an alternative sets of values. Right. So everyone's kind of alluded to that, but uh, and I have follow-up questions if that doesn't make sense necessarily. So how how would the alternative framework of food sovereignty preserve that cultural diversity? That's or how asking. how to um, you know engage with the large international players, governments, and the sort of the mm -hmm. global food system, right? Um, without necessarily, or maybe maybe that's the right solution, right? Is to speak in the language that's understood. Yeah. So, I mean, some of the things that have been sort of scaled up are these ideas of uh, uh, regional labeling, denomination of origin type labelings, especially in, your, in Europe as a, as a region. One way is to, been to, to value, you know, champagne can only be called champagne if it's produced in a certain area. Mm -hmm. This has been sort of uh, applied to cheeses and milks and different kinds of meats. And it's been a way to get actually quite a bit of economic value attached to these cultural specificities, mm -hmm. that has become then exported. You know, a lot of these now, you know, Parma ham is exported at huge uh, profit to elite, slow food, gourmet consumers in North America. So there's a certain danger in sort of trying to put that economic value on these very unique products because then, the, then when they enter that global food chain, they become inaccessible. Quinoa in, in Bolivia is a perfect example. People can't afford to buy quinoa in, in Bolivia because it's become trendy and sort of as a healthy food in North America. And almost all of it, some at the New York Times last year estimated 90%, there aren't great figures on this, but the estimate is 90% of quinoa produced in Bolivia is exported. So people can't even buy it. It's not even if they have the money to buy it. In, um, people aren't who are growing it aren't even eating it because it's so it's become, it's become so valuable that they're not exporting it. So mm -hmm. it's a hard question to answer because at a certain point you don't want people to stop growing quinoa. How do you how do you capture that value within a local system without depending on the economic value being attached to it? Well, and the the other aspects of, uh, of self determination mm -hmm. and community and so on are things which seem to me much more difficult to reduce to a figure. Whereas mm -hmm. you could say how much, is, you know, uh, how much is it worth, to pe people will pay how much more for this particular type of ham than some other type of ham. Mm -hmm. So then you could say, well, the, the value added is, you know, $12 a pound or something, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, the other issues, the issues of the, the serenity issues mm -hmm. really are not issues which are so easily well, brought that's down exactly to what the kind of Phil brought up in the land grab. I mean, here mm -hmm. you have sovereignty, territorial sovereignty being put on the market. So it actually, those things are all becoming marketized. Even those things that we think that can't be. You know, our citizenship is now marketized through, you know, you're only a citizen if you have a certain income that's measured in GDP. That's your contribution. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if one of you have another response to that too. But I think it's, that's what's so scary is that everything is being coming commodified in that way, which is a real challenge to a local self-determination framework. Any other? Do you want to add to that? Want to add, jump in on that? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not immediately. I think it's. I okay. think it's a very difficult question, um, because uh, 
farmers groups or other you know social movements that are trying to achieve food sovereignty are still operating within the global food system as it currently stands so you can't uh, it's it's difficult to get away from some of the uh, the, the dangers of commodifying um, things. Mm -hmm. But I think that what f food sovereignty approach is doing is trying to not make everything about the economic value, but to, to re-embed food systems within uh, local communities and to make people more aware of the cultural value, the nutritional value, the, you know, the, con the social connections of food. And in doing so, not make the dollar the sole reason why they are choosing to eat some foods over another. So, I, I'll, yeah. I'll, yeah, I'd, I'd say a couple of other things there that um, I was interested in he hearing Hannah talking about quinoa, and you know what's re really interesting about that is it's not simply that people in the global north are pulling quinoa from um, Bolivia. Um, because it's, it's now considered trendy and it's, 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 it's a, an item, a valuable item to, to eat here. Mm -hmm. But um, farmers themselves have been uh, put on their heels so much by the, uh, what I would call the food regime, that uh, in, in many cases sometimes survival means having to participate uh, in the short term, at least in this, in this commodity system, um, at, at their own peril because at some point if that system um, intensifies, of course, it, it will undermine their, their ecological base. So, so that's, a, that's a real problem, and I think that um, ultimately one of the goals of food sovereignty is to, to decommodify food as much as possible. And if not um, that, certainly surrounded, I, th I think um, um, Hannah mentioned, or, or maybe it was Rachel, that um, uh, the idea of re-embedding the economy within the culture, within the society, uh, within social rules, is is a is a very strong part of that. Um, but I, I think about this issue in a slightly different way, and I, I think a little bit um, uh, more apoc apocalyptically, uh, along the lines that um, the industrial food system is not sustainable, and uh, one needs to anticipate its collapse. Uh, we can see signs of it collapsing um, in in lots of different ways. I mean, more and more. U.S. farming is going offshore. American farmers are going to Brazil. Land is cheaper there. Their own land has been degraded. Uh, those, so those are some of the signs. Soil fertility is disappearing in this country. So the granary in the United States is, is, um, has, has a limited future. So all of these issues, I think, are really important. And um, um, before you start thinking that I'm just a gloom and doom merchant, what I see is the, the local food movements that are cropping up all over the place, the CSAs, the farmers markets, the, the, you know, the activity urban agriculture in Detroit are all signals that um, people are beginning to anticipate that they need to take care of feeding themselves and feeding their communities, that the governments and the corporations are not going to do it for them. And so I think that there's a lot of hope just in that kind of um, activity that's going on. There's a process of repeasantization that's going on in California. I have a graduate student who's gone out there to um, the guy who made the graph, actually, um, to, to, to do research on repeasantization. Young people are going back to the land um, to, to grow food for local markets because they're recognizing that, um, you know, without access to land and food, um, communities are not, go are not going to survive. So it's so a transition town phenomenon which emerged in England and is now spreading across the world. All of these, I think, are, are um, parts of a a large-scale movement that is it's happening largely under the radar. Mo most people are not paying attention to it. But um, when, you, when, you, when you look at the data on how much urban agriculture has just expanded in the last decade, it's just, it's just phenomenal. So, so, I mean, these are different ways of thinking about how to address the, the kind of question mm -hmm. that Kathy's asking. Great. So you've anticipated my next uh, three or four questions, which that is okay. So I'll, I'll yeah. sort of rephrase it. And I want to make sure to ask, and just building on what you just said, um, ask something that my students are particularly interested in. And that is, um, I myself work in you know, rural areas of southern India, so um, the issues of peasants and small farmers and so on are very familiar to me. But then, you know, in teaching a class on you know, food issues and urban agriculture in Chicago, I and mean, as a non-specialist, uh, 
sort of the how do we think about you know, urban and uh, industrial urban peasants exactly, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we translate a, a powerful framework like food sovereignty into the a kind of you know, industrial landscape like you find in the U.S. or Canada? And I know. Um, that some of you have done some work on that. So that, I mean, Detroit, I mean, is an interesting comparison because you might argue, if you want to use the language of collapse, that Detroit collapsed, right? So that Detroit is revived in, a, in, a, in an amazing way as a consequence, though, of, of a previous collapse, right? So mm -hmm. is that, do we have to wait till everything falls apart? I mean, and um, then when the idea of um, a right to produce as a precursor of a right to consume, I have a good sense, at least personally, of what that would look like in a rural, you know, South Indian setting. But what does the right to produce look like for our urban peasants? What does the right to produce look like for people on the south side of Chicago? Can I respond to that? We have a lot of discussion about this in Vancouver because uh, in Vancouver we have a very, very active urban, coming from Vancouver, Canada, it's a very active urban agriculture movement and also a very active uh, rural sort of local peri-urban farmers who are struggling to maintain their production systems and bringing their food into the city. And on the one hand, um, in places like Detroit and places like Cuba where people are growing large amounts of food on vacant lots uh, and, and actually providing a significant portion of the food for the local food system, the right, the right to access that land, the right to access vacant build buildings, the right to ac access vacant laws, there's a very clear, you can see very clearly where the right to produce comes together with the right to consume. In Vancouver, we have an interesting conundrum where people are promoting urban agriculture, and mostly it's community gardens, and it's very kind of small, pretty, um, to almost token amounts of food being produced. And this has been sort of formalized into, the, into a theory and a concept of what's called agricultural urbanism and, and is being used by planners that if we can plan developments that include often token plots where you can plant a few flowers and a few carrot, carrots, that this can be an incentive to get zoning and bylaws changed to incorporate more good agricultural land into the city. So it's basically a license to pave. You know, I went to a talk in the city of Surrey, which is the fourth largest city in Canada, and it's a suburb of Vancouver, and it has some of the best agricultural land in Canada. Canada, it's in the Delta farmlands, right, the mouth of the ocean, it's very fertile, and they're just sprawling and sprawling and sprawling, and they brought in Desmond Despomia, who's at Columbia mm -hmm. University, who promotes the concept of vertical agriculture, so skyscrapers which contain uh, uh, hydroponics and a very sort of technified food production system and he's uh, promoting this as a way to address food security, as a way to grow food in the city for people in the city who need to eat food and, and his idea that it's all sort of recyclable energy and this whole thing. It's not, never been tried so it's hard to say that how it will work but basically the mayor of Surrey brought him in to try to convince people in the city council that urban agriculture was the way to go so that behind the scenes, additional planning could go forward to pave over more rural agricultural land. So we have to think about these things not in isolation, but in how they work together. Like how does the right to produce, where, where should be fo food produced? Where have people traditionally produced food? How have they done so? Is that, is that way of producing food still relevant for today's society? Those are the kind of hard decisions that, that societies are having to make. Where do we want our food to come from? Who should be producing it, and those are those are choices actually that people have, and that you, know, you, you see that very clearly when stuff like zoning and, and farmland preservation programs come come to the table. Hmm. Well, we weren't going to do that this time for a change, actually, <laughs> for the first time ever. Uh, let me just—we're almost out of time. We'll make sure we get a chance to chat uh, with the speakers. Um, just ask one more question then, I guess, is, um, and that has really to do with agroecology, right? Um, I'm a big fan of agroecological frameworks, and, you know, as someone whose work is historical on, on um, you know, what's thought, sometimes thought of as traditional agriculture over hundreds of years, 
it's 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 sort of entertaining in a way, or, or, or interesting to see the way in which agroecology is given a kind of scientific respectability, you know, to traditional agriculture that's been studied by anthropologists and geographers for a long time, and sort of now we can say in sort of straight up scientific terms, this it works, you know, intercropping, uh, you know, um, pest management, you know, and so on. This is uh, we have numbers now; we can we can prove it. And there's something so ironic, I think, about education programs that introduce or reintroduce these traditional practices, like um, like you know, intercropping, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, this is what um, the kind of knowledge base. It's the question, actually, is about the knowledge base, right? So um, this is what's you know sometimes referred to as traditional knowledge. Or uh, I wonder if there's a kind of agroecology, you know, parallel for traditional knowledge, a way in which you know, the kinds of long-term understandings that farmers have developed over generations can be made respectable, you know, in a, for, in a world forum. Yeah, I think that's a really important question um, because uh, in Malawi, for example, traditional knowledge has been devalued um, through colonial times and in the present day, you know, uh, governments have exhorted Malawians to grow like a modern farmer, and a modern farmer is not, an, you know, using traditional cropping practices, it's using fertilizer and, and uh, hybrid maize seed. And um, I think there's a value to using agroecology as, as, a, as a way of, of merging notions of indigenous knowledge with, with uh, you know, scientific evidence that these kinds of practices that were practiced in the past actually have, you know, value. Um, there's been tremendous devaluing uh, through colonial practices and, and through the contemporary age of, of local knowledges. One of the things that we found in our agriculture and nutrition discussion groups, and I talked about that with some students earlier today, is that uh, about three generations ago, farmers in the north of Malawi used to grow a mix of grains, not just maize, but they grew sorghum, they grew finger millet, they grew pearl millet, and those indigenous grains are more drought tolerant and they grew them as a backup crop to maize. Maize really became dominant in the last hundred years in Malawi, um, but that had been forgotten. And it was actually in those agriculture and nutrition discussion groups where the older women started to talk about, hey, we used to grow these grains and these were really great for when the rains weren't good, so maybe we should think about trying them again. And that's one of the reasons why you see an increase in sorghum production in, in the area. So I think linking uh, this agroecological approach to food sovereignty and to indigenous knowledge. I think those are inter overlapping concepts and, and approaches. Okay, just one very quick little thing then about the land, global land grab. Um, because it's, I think we've heard a lot about the, the Chinese in Africa, for example, but not much about other countries um, and of course uh, also oil palm in Southeast Asia. So I wonder if you could say just a little bit more about the, just give us a clearer sense of the overall structure of this land grab and you know, who's doing what to whom? Well, uh, there's, there's quite a lot of controversy about the land grab because the, the data is very difficult to, to put together in a systematic way. The, um, just in about two weeks ago, I think, Oxfam uh, produced a, um, a report on uh, what's called the land matrix. I'm not sure that Oxfam produced it. I haven't actually had time to look at it because it's it's in the form of maps that um, are interactive, and you know I, that's not my my thing to do interactive mapping on on, on the computer. Um, <laughs> wrong wrong generation. But um, um, what it shows, if you go and look look it up, look up the land matrix, is um, it shows the different sites around the world where land is being taken and who's who's investing in it and what have you. But there's there's a controversy over. Um, how much of it is actually being used and how much of it is actually just sort of sitting there idly, um, you know, incurring value. Because um, one, of the, one of the things that I find fascinating and one of the reasons why I think the land grab is so unique is that it's not simply about China or um, Saudi Arabia going offshore to gain access to land for food for their own populations, but it's, um, it's also about biofuels even more. Um, mm -hmm. But it's also about land speculation, and I think that tells us something about financialization. That because of the, um, the character of the neoliberal economy today, which is premised on um, not creating wealth, but redistributing wealth, 
if you stop and think about it, the rising global inequality is phenomenal at the present time in this country. I mean, the Latin Americanization of the United States is just incredible. Um, and it tells us something about um, the, so, so if, if neoliberalism is about redistributing wealth, not producing wealth, then investors don't have anywhere to go but to look to land as an investment for the, for the long term because of climate change, because of population growth, um, because of rising food prices, because of rising, rising energy prices, because of water scarcity. Um, so all of those factors, I think, um, you know, combine to, to, to expand the land grab. And so, so there's a lot of land that's being purchased or leased um, that is not yet in use. I, I've been following this. There's, there's, a, there's a, um, a listserv called Farmland Grab, all one word, farmlandgrab.org, that, that gives out about every 10 days, it gives out a listing of the, um, the key articles that have come out in the media all over the world on the land grab. And I'm following what's going on in Australia, and it's quite extraordinary. The Chinese are investing in Australian land like crazy. Um, because they know that in the long term that um, they're best served by having access, even if they're not using it now, by, 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 by having access to um, land offshore to, um, you know, to, feed, to feed their population. So, so it's, it's very difficult to sort of give you a clear geography of, um, of who and what is, is doing the land grabbing, but um, as, a, as a general phenomenon, I think it speaks to a, um, a, a very clear crisis in the organization of the world food system on the one hand um, and in the way in which agriculture is being uh, essentially prostituted to investing um, with no particular reason other than to earn value on that land. And, and that to me is, um, as, as Ziegler said back in 2007, the UN Human Rights Rapporteur about biofuels, that's a crime against humanity because it's not dealing with how we're going to manage the future, how we're going to feed everybody and not just the rich, which is essentially how the current global food system is organized. Only those people who can afford to buy the food can actually get the food. But you know, 50 to 50 to 70 percent of those of those of the world's population are not getting access to um, adequate nutritious nutri nutri nutritious food. So that's a big issue, and I think the land grab, I think, is. Um, um, is the, is the bigger is the elephant in the room? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank our speakers. Very much. Well the World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from the Norman Waite Harris Memorial Fund. Download recordings of other events and learn more about the World Beyond the Headlines series at the Center for International Studies website, cis.uchicago.edu.